Up to this point, we've looked at simply supported beams with point loads, and we've looked at simply supported beams with point loads and UDLs. We've also looked at cantilever beams. Now combining all of those things together, we're now going to look at overhanging beams. And what we mean by an overhanging beam is what we see in the diagram there, where a section of the beam extends beyond one of the supports. So another way of viewing this is that we have a simply supported section between the two supports, and then a cantilever section where we see the overhang. Now what we're going to do in this video is we're going to calculate the two support reactions. So we're going to calculate the support reaction at the left hand support, which I'm going to call R subscript L for the reaction at the left hand support. And we're also going to calculate the reaction at the right hand support here, which I'm going to call R subscript R. Now the first thing that we need to do in this particular case is we need to replace our UDL with an equivalent point load. And that was exactly the same approach that we used when we saw simply supported beams previously. Well, in order to replace this UDL with a point load, we first of all need to acknowledge that the UDL weighs 15 newtons per meter, or every meter weighs 15 newtons. Therefore, before we can calculate the total weight of that UDL, we need to know its total length. And here we see the UDL extending from here all the way to the end of the beam here. So underneath, I'm going to write the length and I'm going to specify it's the length of UDL so we don't get confused between this and the overall length of the beam. And we can see that the length of the UDL is 1.5 meters plus 0.8 meters plus 0.9 meters. It's those three subsections added together. So 1.5 plus 0.8 plus 0.9 gives us the overall length of that UDL, and that equals 3.2 meters. So now, in order to calculate the weight or the point load that's going to replace our UDL, we need to do the weight per meter, represented by a lowercase w, times the length of the UDL. Well, we have all of that information. The weight per meter is 15 newtons, 15 newtons for every meter, but that UDL is 3.2 meters long, giving us a weight equal to 48 newtons. So now we're going to replace our UDL of 15 newtons per meter with an equivalent point load and an equivalent point load of 48 newtons. But we need to decide where to place that point load. Well, we've already said that the length of the UDL is 3.2 meters. Therefore, the center is going to be at 1.6 meters from either end. So we could either do 1.6 meters from the left-hand side of the UDL or we can do 1.6 meters from the right hand end of the UDL. If we take 1.6 meters from the left hand side of the UDL, we have 1.5 meters between the two point load forces. And so we're going to be just to the right there of the 22.5 Newton force. And the magnitude is 48 Newtons. Now that we've done that, when we come to do our turning moments, we can disregard the UDL because we've replaced it with an equivalent point load of 48 newtons, and this distance here, we've just said, is 1.6 meters. So next, let's remind ourselves of our two conditions for static equilibrium. The first condition states that the sum of the moments clockwise equals the sum of the moments anti-clockwise. And then the second condition that we apply is that the sum of the forces pushing downwards equals the sum of the forces pushing upwards. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take moments about the left hand support. So over here on the left hand side, and I'm going to call that point A. So I'm going to apply condition one about point A. I'm going to take clockwise and anti-clockwise moments in order to determine my reaction at the right hand side RR. So if you can visualize, let's imagine we push a pin through point A, and then we need to see which direction each of those forces would turn the beam. Well, we can see that the 45 Newton force is trying to turn the beam clockwise, as is the 22.5 Newton force, and so is this new 48 Newton force that replaced our UDL. And in actual fact, there's only one force opposing that, or one force trying to turn the beam anti-clockwise, and that's our reaction at the right-hand support. 
So I'm going to rewrite my statement. I'm going to take the sum of the moments in the clockwise direction, equaling the sum of the moments in the anti-clockwise direction. But I'm going to specify that I'm doing that about point A, just so it's clear what I've done here. So taking clockwise moments about point A, and taking each of those forces in sequence, I can see that I have a 45 Newton force. And that 45 Newton force is a distance of 1.2 metres from the left hand support. The next force that I come to is the 22.5 Newton force. And we need to take care here because we need to multiply it by the distance back to the support. Well, the distance is going to be 1.2 plus 1.5 which is 2.7. And I have a third force causing a clockwise moment, and that's my 48 Newton force that replaced the UDL. And the distance back to the left-hand support this time is 1.6 metres plus 1.2 metres. We always take the distance back to the support. So times 2.8. Now all of that is going to be equal to the force at the right hand support, R subscript R, times the distance to the left hand support. And this is where mistakes can sometimes be made because we need to make sure that we accurately determine the distance between the two supports. Well, in this case, we have 1.2 metres plus 1.5 metres, which is 2.7 metres, plus 0.8 metres, which gives us 3.5 metres. So RR times 3.5 is the same as saying 3.5 RR. My next step then is to simplify that left hand side. So I'm going to do 45 times 1.2 plus 22.5 times 2.7 plus 48 times 2.8. And all of that gives me 249.15. And I'm going to set that equal to my right hand side, which was 3.5 RR. Well, we have a simple linear equation here. All I need to do to get RR on its own is divide each side by 3.5. So RR is going to be 249.15 divided by the 3.5, which gives us 71.186 to three decimal places. So we've found the force at the right-hand support. Next, we need to find the force at the left-hand support. And what we can do here is apply condition two which states that the sum of the forces pushing down equals the sum of the forces pushing up. The important thing to note here is that we're working with the forces this time, not the turning moments. So I have three forces pushing down. I have a 45 Newton force, I have a 22.5 Newton force, and I have a 48 Newton force. And I only have two forces pushing upwards, RL, which we're trying to find, and RR, which we've already found, 71.186. Simplifying the left-hand side, I get 115.5. And my right-hand side remains as RL plus 71.186. Well, hopefully you can see now, as we have a simple linear equation, all I need to do to get RL on its own is subtract 71.186 from each side. So I get 115.5 minus 71.186, giving me a support reaction at the left-hand side of 44.314 Newtons. So now I know that the force at the left-hand support is 44.314 Newtons, and the force at the right-hand support is 71.186 newtons.